the most central premise of the civil rights vision is that statistical disparities in income, occupation, and education, and some other socioeconomic characteristics are moral injustices caused by society. That's, that lies at the core of what you would hear if uh, you were listening and paying a lot of attention to people who talk about civil rights. Now, underlying this premise are several assumptions that have assumed an axiomatic status. And what I mean by an axiomatic, axiomatic status is that these assumptions that underlie the civil rights vision um, are felt to be beyond question. That's what we mean by axiomatic. Now, let me just talk about, uh, let, let me just briefly list the assumptions and then, uh, and then consider them. The first assumption holds that discrimination leads to adverse effects on the achievement of those discriminated against. And indeed, it is this assumption that forms the justification for the notion that blacks or women cannot make broad advances until discrimination is eliminated in the broader society. The second assumption of the civil rights vision holds that statistical differences between races imply or measure discrimination. And we're all familiar with that. That is, someone says, well, while blacks are 13% of the population, they're only 2% of the doctors. And so that is offered uh, as evidence of this assumption that statistical differences between races imply and indeed measure discrimination. Now, the, the third and last assumption is related to the second in that it holds that statistical differences would not arise and surely would not persist in the absence of discrimination. Now, now we can examine these, these assumptions to see just how valid they are. And let's look at the first one. That is, um, that discrimination leads to adverse uh, effects on the achievement of those discriminated against. Well, Jews have faced centuries of discrimination. And moreover, they found that that discrimination did not end when they came to the United States. But yet, Jews, Jewish Americans, uh, have high income and high education. And that observation alone would lead us to question the statement that discrimination leads to adverse effects on the achievement of those discriminated against, but more importantly, the assumption that says that discrimination has to be eliminated in the broader society before there can be broad advances by a group. Now, some people might say, well, Jews uh, are unfair comparison because, well, uh, a Jewish person can just change his name from Goldberg to Williams and uh, just kind of melt into the woodwork. But what about Japanese and Chinese? They appear to me, at least, to be an identifiable minority, and they surely don't have the Jewish option of changing their names. Now, the Japanese and Chinese saw gross discrimination in the United States. We remember in 1940s, during World War II, the Japanese were interned, and their property was virtually confiscated to the extent that they had to sell at very short uh, notice. But yet, according to the 1980 census, Japanese Americans have the highest median family income. Uh, they have the greatest percentage of professional workers. That is, uh, in the, um, nationally, 15% 
of Americans are professional workers. For Japanese, it is 25%, and for Chinese, it's 24%. Also, uh, Japanese and Chinese have the lowest crime rates, the uh, greatest um, marital stability, and the lowest alcoholism rates. Now, someone might say, well, gee, Williams, that's an unfair comparison because uh, people have a special dislike for black Americans, so you can't really use uh, Japanese, Chinese, and Jews. Well, if you look at West Indian American blacks, um, the median family of West Indian American blacks is slightly higher than the median income of Americans in general. Uh, that's in 1972. Moreover, the professional status of West Indian American blacks is slightly above the national norm. As I said, the national, um, uh, the percentage of people across the country are in, that are professional workers are 15% and West Indian Americans are 15.6%. So the West Indian uh, example can deal with the issue of blacks uh, uh, being able to make it in the country without the elimination of discrimination first. That is, I doubt whether a racially discriminatory employer will take time to find out whether the person is a West Indian or just uh, uh, an average black before he decides to discriminate. Let's talk about the second assumption that underlies the civil rights vision, and that is statistical differences, just statistical differences, the, where the argument goes, but for the fact of discrimination, we'd all be alike. Now, I have some statistical differences that I would like to uh, suggest to you or to give to you and ask you to think about what might they explain, what, what kind of story can they tell. <clears throat> black Americans are 13% of the population. However, they are 75% of the NBA players, National Basketball Association players. They're the highest paid players. Now that is a considerable statistical uh, disparity. And what do you want to make of it? I mean, is it, I mean, are blacks conducting some kind of conspiracy against white basketball players? Or if you look at college games, you know, I was looking at the NC2A and I saw all 10 players at various times on the court blacks. Does that mean that there's some kind of conspiracy against white players and, 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 uh, and, and pity the poor Oriental player? <laughs> I, I don't see any at all on the basketball court. You find, you find the same thing in, in football, blacks are 55% of the football players and 38% of the baseball players. So what do you make of that statistical disparity? I mean, can you say, well, you know, these multi-billion dollar firms such as the Los Angeles Lakers and the Philadelphia 76ers, they're just nice guys, unlike IBM and, uh, and uh, uh, Chrysler and AT&T. I doubt whether that explains it at all. <clears throat>